Any day that I can show a film, you know, as a filmmaker, to show your film to people is a really gratifying experience, and to be able to show it to students and colleagues where you work is even better. So I want to thank you all for coming, um, and just say thank you to Dr. Kim and the rest of the faculty lecture series team for organizing this. And I'll just give you an overview of what we're going to do. So uh, we're going to watch The Punishment, so it's about 12 minutes, so uh, you can settle in for that. And then um, I will give a short lecture entitled The Director's Vision, um, Creative uh, Art and Creative Problem Solving. Um, and then I will leave plenty of space at the end for a Q&A. So you will probably have questions about the film, the story, how it was made. So as you're going along um, watching the film, if you have any questions, please keep note of those. And as I'm giving my lecture, if you have any questions, I will be leaving plenty of space at the end for you to do that. Um, but quickly, just before we start the film, I'll give you the synopsis so you'll know as much as an audience member at a film festival would know. Um, the Punishment is about a grief-stricken father named Michael who hunts down the boy responsible for the events who, which led to his son's murder but finds himself unable to escape the consequences of his own violent actions. So if this were my classroom, this would be the part where I would say, OK, you have to turn to the person next to you and discuss who you think killed Michael's son. Um, but because we don't have time to do that, um, I'm going to put some of you out of your misery, so maybe 50%. So for the 50% who are wondering, yes, Michael did kill his son. Um, his own son, Ryan. Uh, he didn't mean to, but he did die as a result of his injuries um, from his punishment. Um, and if you didn't catch it, don't worry. Um, it wasn't meant to, it's not meant to be a film where you, if you didn't catch it the first time, you're wrong. It's a film about designed to follow Michael's emotional journey. And so in the end, the film is about someone who has come to a fork in the road and can no longer continue on his old path. And it's about what, what he's going to do what, at that fork. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit in this um, lecture about some issues that I ran into um, in the making of the film and how um, the director's vision is connected to that. Because I know that in many ways, the idea of what a film director does is kind of a mystery. Just setting myself a timer so I don't go over. Um, everybody knows that the director works with actors. It's the kind of thing you, you know. You know that the act directors will um, try to figure out where to put the camera sometimes. But a lot of what a director is doing is having a vision for the film and being able to keep it in their head. Because there's a whole bunch of people that are looking at you in any given moment during the pre-production, production, and post-production processes. And they want to know what you think about um, options they're giving you. And so you have to have this kind of a vision that can control what goes into the film, um, what doesn't go into the film. And, but before you can do that, before you can be a director, before you can have a vision for anything, there has to be a screenplay. And so I wrote this uh, screenplay, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, writing it and where it came from. So as a screenwriter, um, it was 2017, I was in Scotland studying for my MFA, and I heard one of my friends who's from Northern Ireland pitch a story um, about a mother who has to bring her son to be punished by paramilitaries. And, uh, and then she talked about how it's based on actual events that were happening at the time that I was in Scotland, so 2017. Um, and I was shocked. I shouldn't have been shocked. It should be something everybody knows, but I think most Americans don't know that the um, troubles that were happening in Ireland and meant much of the 20th century still have trouble going on. And there are people who are on either side of the Catholic and Protestant divide there who still uh, rely on paramilitary groups, basically gangsters, to give them justice and to control their uh, neighborhoods. People don't trust the police. And so if your kid gets caught doing something antisocial, say dealing drugs or stealing a car to go joyriding, um, instead of going to the police, 
what happens is the paramilitaries will come to you and say that your child is now going to be punished and you have to bring them at this date, at this time, to this place for their punishment. And so parents will bring their children, because they don't have any other options, to these paramilitaries and say you stole a car, you drove it around and you dumped it somewhere. Um, you'll get shot in the legs and the arms because you, you need a punishment and you need to be a warning for other people. So I tell you that background to let you know some of the background of what's going on in this film is um, my friend had that idea um, to tell a story about a mom who has to bring her son and she's got to deal, struggle with this and like should I follow the way of the people that are living around me or should I go to the police, what do I do? Um, and the more I thought about the story, the more interested I got in what would happen if you were someone who, whose job it was to punish people and your own kid got in trouble? Would you be able to do it? And if you did do it, would you be able to do it again to the next kid down the line? What, what would that do? So that's kind of where this um, story came from. I moved it to Scotland because it was going to be cost prohibitive and dangerous to do it in Northern Ireland, a story like this. So we did it in Scotland. We set it in a gang context but it still has those same contours. Here's a guy who's done something that he can't come back from and he has changed the way he looks at what he has done all along. And so that was where the screenplay came from, the idea for the story. So once I had a screenplay, I could have a vision as a director. Okay, I'm gonna make this movie. What's it gonna look like? What's it gonna sound like? What's it gonna feel like? Those are the kinds of things I was thinking about. And I settled on the idea that what was going to happen in the first half of the film was that we would be, Michael is three days out from the funeral for his son. And he's been drinking ever since, and he is ready to be done with everything, and he doesn't need other people around him, and he's going to just block everything out. And so I decided to use the frame of the film to block things out. It was going to be about him, it was going to be on him, and if people came in, they would be voices. They'd be at the edge of the frame, they'd be off screen. Um, and then par partway through the film, he would meet another parent with a son that he was gonna go get revenge on. Um, but then that was gonna change his ability to stay inside himself. He was gonna connect with someone else. So it was kind of the vision. I was gonna use the frame and the camera movement to show his like internal movement to the film. Um, so that's kind of what the vision was. Now let's talk about what problems there were in the making of the film. Um, before I tell you about problem number one, I'm going to tell you about three problems. There were much more than three problems. And I had um, a moment, at least, of uh, putting this lecture together that I thought, I shouldn't call them problems. They should be opportunities. But then I thought, no, they're really a problem. Like, and then I thought, well, I'll think about what a problem could be in like a positive content context, like a, a math problem. It's not actually like a problem problem. It's like something you get to solve. You know, it's like a challenge. And I thought, no, I'm not going to call them challenges. No, they were problems. Like, and I, what I'm going to do is try to give you a sense of what those problems were, how I eventually figured out how to solve those problems, and give you a takeaway that will apply whether or not you're a filmmaker or, or creative type, or somebody who has to work on projects with other people. Or maybe um, you just daydream problems for yourself, and maybe you'll be able to fix some of those for you. All right, so problem number one. It revealed itself in post-production. All right, so all these problems revealed themselves in post-production, where a lot of problems reveal themselves. So you have the development phase, where you have the script is being written by someone. Um, sometimes they're direct connected to the production, and sometimes they're in their room by themselves writing the story, and then they get it bought by someone who's going to make it. But in development, you have all kinds of room to imagine whatever you want. Um, and so as a screenwriter, I was thinking like a director, and I had ideas. But I was very much like, it's me and the page and the words and the ideas and the story. In pre-production, you are then bringing lots of people in as a producer to work on getting the film ready to shoot. So you have to bring in a cinematographer, and sometimes you have to bring in a director. Well, I was directing it myself, so that was helpful. Um, I uh, secured the services of a really great producer, a cinematographer, a sound person, um, somebody to do costume, and on and on and on. There were about 25, 30 people um, working on the film. Maybe not all at once, but probably more than that. But there's a lot of people working on the film. So 
these are all people that are going to look at you as a director and say, okay, so um, what are we going to do? Um, which shirt should he wear? Uh, I've got three shirts for you to decide from. And then you have to decide. You can't say, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, you can. Um, but if you do that too much, people will go, why are you the director? Because you're supposed to be helping me decide. I gave you three options. You don't just say, well, decide whatever you want. Um, if you're really simpatico with somebody, maybe they, they bring you all the right things and it's just this great. But if a lot of times you're working with somebody you haven't worked with before. And so they want to know. They want to, you have to have an opinion. So your vision helps with that. Um, now what happened with this is this is a scene, as you can see, going to a tunnel. This was not in the film, in case you don't remember. Um, but it was in the screenplay. And it was really important to me while I was writing the screenplay to have this idea that Michael was going to go on a journey across Glasgow. And then at one point, he was going to go through this tunnel into the darkness. And he'd be swallowed up in the darkness. And we'd go, oh no, he's going to do something bad because he's going into the dark. So kind of a simple symbolic metaphor thing, and uh, maybe not the best. But I really was attached to it. Attached enough that my producer and cinematographer and I went out and did a whole day of shooting um, to get the shot going into this tunnel. And just to get nerdy on you, well, to get more nerdy on you, this is a phantom ride, which has been since the beginning of cinema. The concept of the phantom ride is you put a camera on the front of something that's moving. And the earliest ones were trains. So you might see these like ghostly images of going through the countryside on the front of a train. You don't know what's pushing you, but you're being pushed through space. Um, so this was the Phantom Light. So I had all these ideas for it. Well, what wound up happening was um, in the edit, it didn't feel right. It just never felt right. It didn't feel like it belonged. And this was the last problem that I solved. Um, through um, working with thinking a lot and working with other people. But it was the last thing because I hung on to it. Because I had spent so much time and effort, and I would have to go back to the people. There's um, my cinematographer up there in the corner with the camera shooting through. We like, kept doing loops around Glasgow to go through this tunnel, and it was a whole shoot day. Um, and we shot for five days. So it was one of the days was this. And I was like, I can't get rid of it. So and then I was right at the end of the process, I was talking to a directing mentor of mine. Um, who's made a lot of films, showed him the film, he said, it's great. Um, and then what wound up happening was that he, um, he was like, okay, all right, great. And I was like, you know, I don't feel right about this um, scene with the tunnel. And he goes, well, I'm glad you said that, because I don't feel right about it either. And I said, well, I don't, I don't think it works with the style, because we see Michael in every frame in the film, but not in this one. So it's not working. And he's like, okay. Well, that's what I think. And uh, do you have other shots of his face? And I said, yeah, I do. And he, he reminded me that he had told me at one point early on in the process that he, he said, and he says this several times, and he says it a lot, um, the most valuable, the best location in the world is an actor's face. It's not the thing that you like, got the permits for. It's somebody's face going through something. So I was like, OK. So then you can see in the corner, this is what we actually see in the film is his face. It makes a lot more sense for him to just hear that cop that came up to his car window talk about his son, how his son died. Take the mask off. OK. I'm going to take a drink of water. He's just heard a cop tell um, him about how his son died. And he already knows. And so we watch him thinking about it. It works a lot better. So that's problem number one. It was solved through the application of thinking about what the vision for the film was. We're going to stay with Michael, not cut away to something that I thought I needed. And I think what this tells you, what you can take away from this, is that um, in writing, oftentimes people will say, oh, you need to kill your darlings. You need to get rid of the thing that you feel really precious about. Well, at the same time, you also might feel that you've sunk so much energy into this that you have to keep it. But there's also a fallacy called the sunk cost fallacy, because you've done something, you've spent time or money that you have to keep something. And you don't necessarily have to. And so that helped me get through this. OK, so problem number two. Problem number two. So Michael goes up to Claire's house, and he has a conversation with her. Now, at this point in the film, um, or on the shoot day, I was thinking about where to put the camera. And I had this idea in my head. It was going to be a two-shot. Michael was going to come up the path. We'd see it from the side. 
and we'd see Claire open the door, but we wouldn't actually see her step out of the doorway. He'd have a conversation with somebody inside the doorway, so we wouldn't see her yet. This would be good because in the very next scene, when he's finally having to connect with someone, she's made him come in and wait for her son to come home and have tea. Um, he's really uncomfortable, and then the camera slowly pulls out as she talks to him about her son, and he's like talking to her. The camera pulls and pulls and pulls back, and then you see her, and then you realize like he's making a connection with her. He starts offering her advice about how to deal with her son. Um, and so that was the idea, but on the shoot day I thought, man, it looks really boring because there's just a blank wall behind them of the house. And I thought, oh, my cinematographer's not going to like that. She's going to say, That's, there's no depth to the image. Why, well, we should do something else. So instead of talking to her about it, I just said, oh, I'm going to change it. I'm going to do a really conventional, normal dialogue scene, back and forth between two people. Well, so that's what we shot. And it, we put it in the film. And it ruined the tension of the next scene, where we slowly reveal Claire, because we'd looked at her like that in the whole bunch of the edit, and it, the next scene wasn't working. Um, so then it was a matter of thinking, like, okay, got to go back to the vision. The vision is, in this point, we're with Michael. We're not thinking about her. All right, what do we do? So we thought, well, we'll just leave it on him the whole time, which felt really weird and wasn't working. It was like, this feels like they made a mistake when they were shooting, and they had to have this shot of him, and we had to just look at it. So I was watching other films by other filmmakers, and I saw a couple of films by Steven Soderbergh. And he has a couple of films where he'll have a conversation between two people, where he actually cuts back and forth between two, two different angles on one character's face. So where you would expect to see the other person that they're talking to, and that other person talk, you actually only ever see the other slight other side of the first character's face, which really makes you think, what is that person actually thinking about? And then it kind of makes them two-faced as you're watching it. And you think, are they actually telling the truth? Because we're just cutting back and forth between two angles on their face. It feels weird, and it works as uh, something in the director's toolkit. Well, I hadn't thought about it until I was watching these films and saw him use it twice and thought, I'm going to try that. And so what we wind up having is Michael walks up the path, um, and he's having a conversation with Claire. We never see Claire in that conversation until the very end. You can't really see her. Um, but instead, we have the nice face Michael talking to this woman about her son. And then we have very serious Michael walking up the path. And it worked. Um, and it was a matter of going back to the vision and thinking, what was the original idea for this scene? I have to go back to it. Now, my takeaway from this is probably maybe, maybe the best takeaway from this whole lecture is um, well, let me read it because I've already forgotten. It's so great. Um, don't make decisions based on fear. You can, make, you can change your mind. You can change your mind because you're making a mistake. But acknowledge that I've made a mistake, and now I'm going to change and do something else. Don't change your mind because you're afraid you're going to make a mistake. Because that's what I did. I was like, I'm afraid I'm going to do something wrong. I'm not going to do this scene the way other people would do it. And so I actually did it wrong because I was afraid, and I hadn't thought through it. Now, part of the problem is, is, as a director, everyone's looking at you. So if you stop and you say, I have to go away and think about this for a minute, it's, there's one person whose job it is to make sure that you're on time. And they come up to you and they go, why are you? No, we have to, we're behind already. Um, time is money. And, and it, that's stressful. So I try to get out of it by just doing something else. Shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have made a decision based on fear. I should have made a decision based on information or even because I wanted to, but not because I was afraid. All right, so problem number three. And then we'll be done. And then you can ask me questions. Problem number three, the punch. It is really gratifying. It's really great to hear everyone freak out every time that punch lands. It's really good. So thank you. Um, and part of it is it's really surprising. Uh, you don't expect it. And this is a really great uh, behind the scenes still by Todd Richter. I just want to point it out. He did a great job of getting down in there and getting a really great angle on uh, Cal McEnich punching Jenny Keenan Green, except she, he didn't actually punch her. So, um, and then there were many times in the edit where I thought, man, that's a really good angle. Why didn't I use that angle? I used the angle I used. Man, that guy's better than me. Um, because it, the punch wasn't really working. It didn't feel real. 
because it wasn't real, and I wasn't sure how to edit it together. And I hadn't shot the scene in the way I had originally thought because I was running out of time, so I made some decisions to shorten some of the duration of the shots we were getting. So I only got the first half of the scene from the angle from the punch, and the rest of it was a different time. If I'd gotten the whole scene from all the angles, I could have cut something together very quickly that worked, but it was difficult to cut this together. Um, now, the way this was solved is not by going back to the vision, because sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you're like, OK, I have a vision. And it's like, well, sometimes it's not like an artistic problem that you're having. Maybe it's a technical problem. We didn't really know how to make the punch work. Um, so we were in the edit suites at the Screen Academy, working on the punch, working on it, working on it. Um, one of the professors comes over and says, hey, there's a guy in the other room. He's a really good editor, and he works on TV shows and movies down in London. And I told him about your problem with the punch. I was like, oh, I don't want someone from London knowing that I'm having problems with punches. And I was mad. And then she brings him over. I was like, don't do it. And then he, she brings him over, and he, he watches the scene. And he goes, oh, that's really easy. Just cut two frames out of the middle of the punch. So just a couple fractions of a second. And it'll make it look like it's going through, or like it's connecting. I was like, OK. And it'll just speed it up real fast. And we did it. We cut it out. Watched it back with him and thought, oh, wow, that really works. Oh, good, thank you. That was really great. Um, so it wasn't a matter of going back to the vision. It was bring, having an expert <laughs> come in and tell us how to do it. And sometimes what you need is fresh eyes on your project, on what you're doing. It's not going back into your own head and thinking about what you want, but getting somebody else to look at it. And even if they're not an expert, maybe somebody new looking at your project is going to notice something or just have an idea. So sometimes. When you're running into an issue as a director or any, someone in life, get fresh eyes on your project.